Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment. The assumption that because it's a dark horizon, it must be a dark future is not true. A, a dark horizon can separate you from heaven. Coming up, I talk with renowned author and world traveler Barry Lopez about his new memoir and the philosophy of writing that has guided him for more than 50 years. That's Dialogue next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today has been to more than 70 countries on every continent. He's explored underwater worlds as well. But numbers aren't what matters, says Barry Lopez. It's the stories that count. And he's been telling them for more than five decades. Known for his ability to illuminate the connections between humans and the natural world, Lopez won the National Book Award in 1986 for Arctic Dreams. Many also know him for writing Of Wolves and Men, a finalist for the National Book Award in 1980. All told, Lopez has penned more than 15 works of fiction and nonfiction, as well as countless essays. His latest book is a memoir called Horizon. In it, he takes the reader on a trip back to six regions of the world he's visited. But the book is far from a travelogue. In it, Lopez also shares his deep concern about the damage humans have caused to the planet and also the power of stories to carry the wisdom for solutions. I sat down with Barry Lopez at the 2019 Sun Valley Writers Conference. Our conversation was more than an hour long, both a look back at Lopez's past and a window on his hopes for the future. So I decided to turn it into a two-part dialogue. In this first episode, Lopez reflects on why it took 30 years to work on Horizon, his writing style, and some of the ethical challenges he's faced. But first, I asked him about several connections he has to Idaho. Well, welcome. Welcome to Idaho, or I guess I should say welcome back, because there's an interesting story about how you were in Ketchum Sun Valley, what, 27 years 20, ago now? 27 years ago, yes. Um, I got a a letter from someone I didn't know, John Mexic, and he was the uh, headmaster at the community school, and he said, uh, we would love it if you would come and give a commencement address. Um, part of you says, "How did? who would know who I was, kind of reaction. But that letter was signed by every student in that class, and I thought, I don't even want to know the person that would say no to this. So I came over and gave my talk and met the students. We had a wonderful time. And to this day, I meet those students somewhere on the road in Austin or New York or LA or something. And they're, they're very cordial and, and I guess very grateful. And every once in a while in your life, you have an opportunity to be of service to the larger community. And that was one of them. I was glad for the invitation. John and I stayed in in touch, and although I've been back here in Sun Valley two or three times, I've never been to uh, the Writers' Conference here. So it's sort of come full circle. That's wonderful. Do you remember what you spoke to them about in your commencement address? Um, no, I don't. But I brought with me, uh, this time I brought uh, the transcript of what I had written for that day. So I was thinking, you should read it again. And I, it, it's very rare that I go back and read anything that I've written. Uh, it makes me self-conscious and it reminds me that the clock is ticking and have you done anything since then? Or, you know, are you going to- I think to, you've done a few things. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah if, you, if you're lucky, you end up doing a few things. But um, my, my mindset about my work is, um, Maybe that was really good, and it doesn't make any difference. You're at ground zero, start all over again. And it's a good frame of mind to um, go off on a project, to believe uh, because you know that you don't know. 
if you if you start off thinking you know or you're going to teach somebody something then the reader is starting to go like this you know no thanks don't tell me that you know and I don't know that they I, I think you strive or some do some writers strive you want to be the reader's companion not not the reader's authority you want to um, show your uh, distant affection for them and um, ask them to join you in something that you're earnestly involved in and looking very close, very hard for them. Well, it's a beautiful story and those uh, young people would now be, what, 35 years old if they were 18 and right. help me out with this, 18 and 19, 45 years old, 45. Yeah. So, wow, that means I'm <laughs> <laughs> also that much older. Well, a, a critical um, generation to speak to about the issues that are still uh, in the forefront. Um, before we get to that, though, um, I wanted to also mention that your wife is from Salmon, Idaho. She was born and raised in Salmon, yes. Five generations? Five generations, the Gortney family. So you've spent some time around there, I'm guessing. And yes, and, and, you know, running the Middle Fork um, and just being in that environment. Uh, I'm very comfortable there. Deborah's comfortable. And uh, I think salmon might play another role. Uh, I noticed uh, in your book you mentioned oh, in, that there Antarctica. is a... Yes, at the South <clears throat> Pole, I believe right. that there is a sign with a cutout of a salmon on it that says 9,512 miles to Salmon, Idaho. Now, right. how did that get there? It got there because the, uh, a contract went out for bid for uh, workers to perform, you know, operating heavy equipment, moving things, cooking, all of that kind of stuff. And for several years, the contract was won by an outfit that was in Salmon. Um, so Salmon turned out to be a major town where Antarctica was concerned, and some of the some of the uh, employees who were working at South Pole uh, m made a cardboard or a plywood cutout of a salmon and painted it up and how many miles to home. So it it's not how many miles to San Francisco or how many miles to Paris, it's how many miles to salmon. And here I thought maybe you put it up in honor of, of your wife or something I, I like that. I could claim that, but that would be foolish, wrong, and I'd pay for it. Well, what I like about that and, and, and your books is it's it, the small details like that that really help flesh out a story. I yes. mean, you know, the fact that you even noticed that there was that sign and that you put it in there and uh, it opens up a whole other story about these workers. And that's, I think, a hallmark of, of your work. You're talking about broader issues, uh, whether that be cultural issues in another right. country or now climate change, but it's all within this setting of using small details to help illustrate those? Uh, my idea of the reader is <clears throat> that she or he wants to be, wants to know where are we, exactly where we are, how can I line myself up to look at whatever it is that you're talking about. So if it's a concrete place that's fleshed out by details, the reader can think, oh, I, I get an image of that. And it's much easier then to have that conversation with the reader about larger issues. Because you're not lecturing, you're just kind of... God forbid. <laughs> uh, who likes a lecture? I, th that's why I say that the, for me the, the, the obligation that the writer has is to be a companion, not, not to be an authority. I mean, if you... I've spent more than 50 years doing this, and I've learned a lot about a lot of things, but I take an eraser to my brain when I start uh, because none of that none of that really means anything if the, 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 the only point is this place now and these ideas you've also said and I can appreciate this greatly that uh, you're afraid just that fear is is a important motivator it, I think if you're not afraid at some level really afraid not pretend afraid uh, intimidated by what it is that you're trying to do, it's not going to be very good. Um, and that's why I, 
I often think nothing you've done counts. We're here, we're now, and you have to do this all over again and make it really good. Um, nobody cares how much you know. Uh, if it has a place in the story, great to bring it up. If it doesn't, please don't bother me with it. Um, because if you're trying in a book to be authoritative by mentioning arcane detail, for example, it is actually annoys the reader, I think, um, to be put on the defensive themselves. Oh, I never knew that kind of thing. If you, if you approach it, the, the task of using language to make some distant place come alive, if you see it um, as a, a friendly gesture toward the reader to say, hey, check this out, and then describe it. And I often think that I move my hand at that point to the lower back and then just push the person into the place and I disappear. But I've heard you say that you have a bit of regret at nudging people or that people got interested in these various places because of reading your writing and it, then they they, they go went, there they go there and the place becomes really popular it um, I don't know what to do about that I, I, ha I crossed a kind of Rubicon with myself years ago doing a story for National Geographic some in the mid 80s um, and uh, a BLM <clears throat> Uh, employee told me where a ground glyph right. was and amazing that's the one of the horse right the horse yeah and it, it it was very little disturbed and I knew that I had an ethical obligation here I had to figure out and that was if I was going to um, describe it and make it if you will enticing then I was responsible for any damage that might be done in the future. So um, I, I wrote a story about the horse um, with directions that wouldn't have gotten anybody mm -hmm. there if they actually followed them. I actually looked at a map when I <laughs> oh, read that story, yeah. trying to figure, not to go there, but to just approximate it. Yeah, you it. can. Yeah. So that, that was a change that I never saw before um, as a writer that I felt I had to make. I, it was be irresponsible, which raises the whole question of how can you describe these exotic, faraway places, you know, working in the interior of Antarctica or something like that, without understanding that you might be opening the floodgates here. And the way I would get around it is to, to understand that in Antarctica, for example, it's uh, enormously expensive and logistically extremely difficult to get to some of the places that I worked in. So if you describe them carefully, it, it does, it's not, people aren't going to be able to go there. But I, I, I think particularly in this age, not, where we have an enormous number of people, really, who can afford to go anywhere in the world. So you're not safe anymore saying, well, you know, nobody's going to make the effort to come this far. Um, I've also made other decisions which I guess are more problematic. Um, I've seen things that I deliberately did not write about because they would encourage um, prejudicial views of Native people, for example. Some some scene that made somebody look bad, I just chose not to say anything about it. I, I don't want to put a person at a disadvantage when I write about them. And you, I tell people when we embark on something, usually I know the people pretty well before I get invited or to go, um, but I always say, look, everybody's gonna lose their temper, everybody's gonna have a bad day, um, we're going to become irritated with each other's tics. Everybody knows that. Why would you write about it? What I want to see is a person who appears from the outside to be just an ordinary human being come to life doing what they love, and then they glow in, in a way that every person can appreciate. And they say, I, I want to be like her. I want to do my job like her. 
Um, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm there to use language to help readers understand better uh, their place in the world, where they feel comfortable, where they feel a sense of self-worth and of possibility. You know, when I read your work, I'm simultaneously envious, <laughs> as I'm sure a lot of people are, uh, at all the places you've been. But also, lately, I start thinking about, and I've thought about this in my own life, when you, when you fly, when you travel to all these places, you are contributing to uh, climate change. We know that when you take airplanes or when right. you take the boats out. And I watch people on Instagram, photographers go all these places to describe the melting right. icebergs. And I think, but you just, you just tra you traveled in a way that is contributing to this problem. So how do you answer people who say, you know, Mr. Lopez, you've done all this traveling, but you're contributing to climate change when you do it? I say you're right. And what, what I then do about it is my, that's my decision and um, my, I've got to review my rationale and I can tell you where I am now. I have traveled all of my adult life very heavily for certain periods of time. Um, I, I, I once became preoccupied with the question of what is it that people need so desperately they've got to have it tomorrow because that's what's in air freighters flying all over the world. Is it tulips from the Netherlands that are on the table in, the, in New York and the apartment on the next morning? Um, is it medicine? It, it turns out to be largely junk. Golf balls and things like that, it, but they have to have it tomorrow. And in, in order to, to try to understand that world, you know, I traveled maniacally. Um, I, I traveled about 130 some thousand miles in one month because I, I needed to be inside this phenomenon and boy is that a carbon footprint. I, I, would, de I def would defend it at the time, 1996, um, because it just wasn't in the air then about personal responsibility for global climate change. Where, where I am today is I, I am right on the verge of saying, I've had a really extraordinary life. Um, it grew up uh, in, a, in a time when nobody knew about global climate change. And I think I want to say I'm not doing that anymore. Um, I can come up with all these reasons why it should be done. And I think I, I would defend everything I've done as a, as a writer who travels very heavily, but I don't see it anymore. Um, my studio is full of notebooks from 50 years of work. Um, there, there's an enormous amount of material written down there, and I'm, I'm very seriously considering making that decision. I'm not gonna go anymore, and I'm not asking you to not go, that's your decision, but I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. I'm also in the latter part of my life. So what would you say to people who want to travel? It opens up your life, obviously, to travel, mm. you know, to see different points of view. Right. So how, what would you say to people who want to do that but are also self-conscious about the effects of it? I don't know. Each person has to work through that dilemma. Um, if, if somebody had told me, listen, Barry, you can't, can't travel like this, we're not going to let you do that. I would have broken the rules and done exactly what I wanted to do because I was so driven to get on the plane, cross the ocean, go to Antarctica. Um, it, it, it made me tick. It, it's, if I think about a young person in their early 20s or something like that, telling them not to do this, um, I don't know if I'd I'd feel comfortable doing that. The, the, the idea is to discover what it is that's driving you and turn it into something that helps all of us. And So if it's in the service of something oh, I, larger, then you would say, yeah, go do it. I, I would say that. Um, you can buy carbon offsets now, too. I don't know if I'd go that far. Um, 
because you know you're in anyway. <laughs> um, you, you have to be responsible now for the fate of other people in ways that you never thought about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a forcing pressure from global climate change, ocean acidification, um, methane gas pouring out of Siberian tundra. There, there are these uh, apolitical, um, biological, and um, meteorological issues that have to be addressed whether we do or not is our decision but whether we do or not is not going to stop them and if you and I were to get up walk out that door and walk into Sun Valley Idaho of the year 2040 our jaws would drop not from what we could see immediately but the social and economic change that these things are going to bring to us. And we're flat not prepared, absolutely not prepared. It's criminal that bodies, political bodies, are paying absolutely no attention to global climate change. It, it, it's criminal that doing that. It's criminally irresponsible to, to pretend that you represent a people and determine their fate and not be paying attention to the most important disaster coming and sitting there on the horizon. Well, thank you for the segue, sitting <laughs> on the horizon. <laughs> I was gonna bring that up anyway. You know, you mentioned 20 years out, which is the horizon. You feel you can see what's yeah. on that horizon. This is the, the name of your newest work, Horizon. Let's talk a little bit first about the title and then about why you wanted to write sure. it. Um, You've, you've mentioned that um, the horizon is the line between the, the known and the unknown and that it preoccupies you and what lies on the other side of the horizon in view, your view is like a source of belief. It's out there mm -hmm. um, versus what some people might say is right here and now is the source of belief. But at any rate, talk to me about the title. Um, was it were you ruminating on it for a while, or no, did you it, know all along? Because this is a 30-year baby right here. You've been thinking about this. You've been, right. I think you signed a contract back in 89 or something. Yeah, I did. I it. signed a contract in 1989, um, but everybody, uh, and it was called Horizon at that time. Okay, that's, I was wondering about that. It was always called Horizon. Um, but I wasn't uh, mature enough. I hadn't traveled enough, um, and I, I was not well prepared to write what I was proposing. So everybody involved, you know, my agent and publisher and my editor, everybody knew that it was going to be a long time before I sat down. But it was out on the book. horizon. <laughs> but it was out on the horizon, right. It's, um, you know, you have to, in, in these kinds of conversations with someone about your work, yeah. you've got to find these uh, roots to get away right. from a question that is more complicated right. than you I can understand. answer in a few I minutes. I understand. You can't come up with a pithy reason for why. Well, I did. It? You did? Okay. <laughs> I did. What's the, pith what's, what's the, what's the I say as we say in journalism, 20, what's the nut graph? <laughs> the nut graph is that uh, for 25 years the book worked on me, and then for five years I worked on the book. So I sat down five years ago to write the book and slowly disengaged from lots of projects in order to finish. Um, but I, I put it off with no, with no uh, uh, sense of bailing on a task because I knew I had to know more that what I was proposing was preposterous. And it, you, you can't just say you're going to write about something that involves an enormous amount of travel and then not do the travel. Why did the title stay the same, though? over all those decades? The things I needed to know, I knew in outline. And I imagined how that, it, it, if it was music graphed, I, I could see how it would go like this, these two or three sinusoidal curves, and then it would end gracefully. I, I could see that, I could imagine it. It had its own horizons, those waves do. And I, I never, developed any idea that contradicted what I was after. What I discovered was, um, with regard to global climate change, um, we all know what's 
driving us into the future and it's difficult to contemplate it and discomforting to do that. So why don't we think about what is calling us into the future? What is lying out there in the make-believe world of the imagination that draws us and gives us a sense of the movement is positive? In, instead of moving 100 miles an hour into a brick wall, we think if we can only get through this difficult period, what might we reify out there? What might we imagine, which we don't have now? What's out on the horizon is not just dire, but it's promise. Yes. The assumption that because it's a dark horizon, it must be a dark future, is not true. A, a dark horizon can separate you from heaven. The, the, the challenge for human beings is to uh, reimagine as the horizon approaches, more and more is revealed. And if you posit in your own imagination that it's all going to be darkness, then you're dead in the water. It's like a kind of psychic suicide. But if you work with other women and men and imagine a world out there that's socially reorganized um, and not polluting itself, you can create that. It, it's not just, it's not a matter solely of engineering, it's reimagining. Redreaming, I think you've called it. I did. I said, we, we have to redream all of this. But that horizon, as you say, you know, comes closer and closer. Then there's a new horizon. Right. What was the horizon is now the present. So it's a moving thing. And, and my perception is that some people just keep putting it off because they say it's on the horizon. Yeah. We're not there yet. But then as you you know, 20 years, 10 years, all of a sudden it's there. The it, horizon it, is there. It's right around the so corner. So you have to... Uh, do something about that and, pending yes, horizon. And, and then the question is what? what? What do we do? You've been listening to the first part of my discussion with award-winning author Barry Lopez, taped at the 2019 Sun Valley Writers Conference. Next week, part two, in which Lopez talks more about how he composed his memoir, Horizon, and what's next on his own horizon. And he shares a very personal experience that has shaped his life both as a writer and as a human being. Be sure to tune in. In the meantime, if you want to stream any of our conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference, just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for joining us. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment.